One very nice property of the reversible logic paradigm we introduced in the previous video is that it allows to very naturally map binary numbers into vectors and the operations performed by reversible circuits into matrices that transform these vectors. Now, this can be very attractive because it then becomes very easy to take an input value given by a vector and simply multiply it by the different matrices that represent the gates of a circuit to obtain its corresponding output. So let's do a step-by-step -step description of how to start working with vectors and matrices using the rules of linear algebra to represent classical reversible circuits, which are going to be the basis to understand the more general case given by quantum circuits. So the first thing we're going to do is take our fundamental unit of information, the bit, and its corresponding values of 0 and 1, and associate with them some column vectors. So in the case of bit 0, we're going to use vector 1, 0. And in the case of bit 1, we're going to use vector 0, 1. And then we could give these vectors any name we want, right? So we could call this vector A and this one vector V or even just, you know, vectors 0 and 1. But instead, what we're going to do is start using some of the more common notation that is reserved for the vectors encountered in quantum mechanics. And that is known as bracket notation. So what we're going to do to represent the vector for bit 0 is take the number 0 and put it inside these brackets where we have a vertical line to the left and then this angular bracket to the right. And this is known as a ket. And in the case of zero, we call it ket zero. And similarly, for the vector of bit one, we're gonna just put a one in between those brackets. Now, all this really means is that these are vectors that have some special properties and what those properties are, we're going to be uncovering as we start expanding our representation of using vectors to represent quantum bits. But for now, in the case of classical bits, we can just say that in general, we can express our bits by a vector, let's call it B, that has components, let's say beta zero and beta one, where beta sub i, where you know this i can be either zero or one, must be either the number zero or the number one. Now, all we're doing here is just giving a general expression for the column vector representation of a bit. However, if we take a closer look at this definition, there's something that's missing because with what we have here, we could have a vector of the form zero, zero, which is not a valid representation of a bit being either zero or one or we could also have a vector one, one, which again is not a valid representation of what we have defined for zero and one. So we need to add some additional restriction that guarantees that when the value of beta zero is zero, the value of beta one must be one and vice versa. Now, a way to add that restriction is by using, for example, the length of the vector. So let's say we have a, a general vector, let's call it uh, x, with components x0 and x1. Let's call this vector x. The length of that vector, so the distance from the origin to the tip of the vector, is given by the square root of the sum of its components squared. So if for our vector v, we restrict that its length is always equal to one, then that guarantees that the only acceptable values are the ones we have for ket zero and ket one. Why? Well, because the other two cases in which we had a vector zero, zero, this will have length of zero. And in the case of the vector one, one, well, that would have length of square root of one squared plus one squared, a square root of two. So if we go back up here to our definition of the bit B and add the restriction that the length of that vector must be equal to one, then that guarantees that the only valid 
vectors allowed by this definition are the ones that represent our bit zero and our bit one. Now you might say, well, this is a really lengthy definition to just say that we're gonna restrict the values of our vectors to be one zero in the case of cat zero and zero one in the case of cat one. And yes, that's true, but the idea here is to start familiarizing ourselves with the nomenclature that we're gonna be using when we encounter qubits or quantum bits, which are the basic units of information in quantum computing. And what better way to introduce this type of notation than doing it with a simple example like with a classical bit. So again, all we're saying here is that the vector representation of a classical bit is given by a column vector with values beta zero and beta one, where beta zero and beta one can only take values of zero and one, but where we're restricting them to meet this condition of having the length of the vector be equal to one to avoid having invalid vectors, like the ones down here, where we have both entries being zero or both entries being one. Now, before moving on to how to describe this type of vectors using Python, we need to talk about a very important concept when uh, dealing with uh, vectors in general, and it is that of the dot product. So the dot product is an operation between two vectors that basically measures how similar they are to each other. So the way we define the dot product, which we represent with a dot between two vectors, is by taking the transpose of one vector and then multiplying it by the other vector itself. So in this particular case, for example, the transpose of x, so if, if x is a vector given by the components x0 and x1, then its transpose is basically the row vector x0, x1. And then when we multiply that with a vector of y, let's say given by components y0 and y1, then what we do here is just standard matrix multiplication where we treat these vectors as matrices. So, so the, the result of this would be x0 times y0 plus x1 times y1. Now for our definition of the vector representation of a bit for, you know, let's say b, beta 0, beta 1, its row vector representation is important enough that it has its own symbol. And the way we represent it is by again taking this letter B and putting it in between these brackets where we now have a vertical bar to the right and this angular bracket to the left. And then that will be equal to the row vector representation of uh, our ket B. Remember, this is called a ket. So we have beta zero and beta one, and we call this a bra. So together, this type of representation is what we call bra ket notation, where the bra is basically the row vector representation of a ket. Now, when we start dealing with qubits, we will see that we need an additional condition to represent the bra, and that will be by taking the complex conjugate of its components, but we'll, we'll get there once we start introducing those more advanced concepts. Now, one nice thing about the dot product is that we can represent the length of a vector by taking the dot product of that vector with itself. So for example, if we were to take the vector x dot x, that will be x0, x1 times x0, x1, which basically gives us x0 squared plus x1 squared, which is the length of the vector squared. So we can do the same thing with our vector representation of bits and take the bra and then simply multiply it with the ket. Now in this notation, what we're actually going to do is combine these two middle bars and use just a single one. And we call this the inner product between the two vectors. And that's basically the same as we have above for x. So beta zero, beta one, and here beta zero and beta one, which is going to give us beta zero squared plus beta one squared, which is basically the length of the vector squared. So now let's go ahead and take a look and see how would we define vectors in Python and uh, the different operations we can perform on them. And for that, we're going to import a library we already introduced, which is NumPy. Uh, 
And we're also going to import SymPy, which is a symbolic toolbox in Python. And the only reason we're, we're gonna use this is just to display our vectors a, a little bit more nicely. So let's first define our ket zero, that if you recall, was a column vector with an entry of one at the top and a zero at the bottom. And for that, we're going to use this numpy array object. Uh, and we're gonna pass to it a list where we will have an element of one at the top and zero at the bottom. And if we print that, we can see our column vector representation. Now with SymPy, what we can do is turn this into a matrix object, and then we can display it uh, in LaTeX. So it makes things a little bit easier to, to follow. Now we can do the same thing to represent our ket one but instead, now we're going to define a vector with a zero at the top and a one at the bottom. And then here's our representation. Now, if we want to find the length of a vector, we said that what we can do is take the square root of the sum of its entries squared. So NumPy has um, a lot of helpful functions. Like for example, we can do MP sum, and if we pass an array that's going to sum the components of, of the vector we're passing. So if we take our ket zero, then square its components. So in Python, we square by using two uh, asterisks. And then if we perform this operation on a NumPy array, that is going to be done uh, element wise. So each of the elements is going to be squared. And then this MP sum is gonna sum those elements. And then we can also use the square root function in NumPy to find the result. So as expected, that gave, a, gave us a length of one. Now let's go ahead and do the same thing for one of those invalid vectors we had before. So for example, let's define a vector, let's call it once, where we have the same NumPy array, but we're gonna have both elements be equal to one. And if we take this same function we had here to find the length, but we pass this vector instead, that should give us square root of two. And that indeed gives us 1.41, which is square root of two. So that's one way to find the length of a vector, for example. But we also said that we can find it by taking the dot product of a vector with itself. So in NumPy, we can do that using this MP v for vector dot, so that performs the dot product between two vectors. And then if we pass you know, the same vector twice to this function, it's going to compute the dot product between these two. So what it's going to do is turn this into a row vector and then multiply with this column vector we had defined before. And this should give us, uh, again, a value of one. Now here, what we're getting is actually the length of the vector squared, but since one squared, is equal to one, we will get one. So in reality, we'll have to take the square root if we wanted the length of that vector, right? Uh, similarly, we could do that with the vector here we define above called ones. So if we do that here, we should get again square root of two. And there we have it. Now, if we were to perform the dot product between ket zero and ket one, these two vectors are fully orthogonal to each other. So the dot product should actually give us a value of zero. So if we do uh, numpy v dot of ket zero with ket one, we get a value of zero. So the next question is, how do we go from a single bit representation using this column vector format to having or representing more bits? So for that, we have to introduce a new concept, which is the Kronecker product. So the Kronecker product between two vectors, let's say vector X and vector Y is represented with this symbol. And its definition is that if we now use the vector representation for X and Y, the resulting Kronecker product is found by taking the first component of X and multiplying it with the vector y, and then the second component of x, so x1, and multiplying it again by y, 
and stacking those two together. So performing the multiplication gives us x0, y0, x0, y1, x1, y0, and x1, y1. So when dealing with binary numbers, if we want to represent something that has more than one bit, what we do is take the Kronecker product of the vector representation of those bits. So let's take, for example, the binary number, let's call it B, one zero, which, you know, in decimal is uh, the number two. So what we would do is take the Kronecker product of the ket representation of bit one and the ket representation of bit zero. So if we replace that with our column vectors, we can perform the Kronecker product using the definition above. And what we will get is a column vector of length equal to the multiplication of the original two vectors. So we started with vectors of length two and we end up with a vector of length four. And of course we can generalize this to any number of bits. So we can represent a binary number with m bits, for example, by taking the Kronecker products of the vector representation of each of those bits, which we can also represent using a more compact notation, similar to the big sum or sigma notation when we perform uh, addition, by taking a larger symbol of this Kronecker product and specifying some indices. So th this too, the, this top and bottom notations are uh, equivalent to, to each other. Now, one comment I want to, to make regarding notation is that we will often see what is uh, maybe considered by some to be an abuse of notation uh, in which if, if we were to express, let's say, the binary number 101 in its vector form, we would have to do 1 tensored 0 tensored 1. This is often expressed as just taking that binary number inside our ket symbol. So this is a representation that we will use often. Uh, and uh, whenever you see, you know, binary numbers inside kets, what it really means is that we're performing the tensor product of the vector representation of each of those bits. So in, in Python, if we want to perform the Kronecker product between two vectors, we can again use NumPy. So we do MP cron of let's say ket1 and ket0 and let's store that in for example a vector called ket10 and if we display that we can see it gives us the vector representation of performing the Kronecker product between those two vectors. So that's it for this video and what we will cover next is how to represent now reversible circuits as matrices that transform these vectors that represent our binary numbers that we use as inputs and outputs to those circuits. Thanks again and hope to see you in the next video.